Hello, and welcome to Goose Tracks. Ooh. Ooh. Today, we're going to be reading Stay Out of the Basement. We were supposed to read It Came from Beneath the Kitchen Sink, but I managed to order this one and not the other one, even though I thought I had ordered both. So that's gonna be next time. The rules of Goose Tracks are very, very simple. You drink if it's stupid, you drink if it's scary. That's it, those are the only rules. Hopefully we can uh, keep track of those together. Today we'll be drinking some nonsense I purchased at the alcohol store. It has a 15% ABV and I bought it thinking, ah, oh, it goes with all the other chemicals that live beneath the kitchen sink, but it doesn't really go with the basement thing as much. So just know I'm drinking some hard nonsense for you guys. Let's crack this puppy open. I hope it tastes like ass. Oh, I can smell it. Oh no, it's a bad sign. It smells blue. Oh, stay out of the basement. So this particular book starts like any Goosebumps book starts with uh, dialogue, obviously. So it starts with Hey Dad Catch, where basically the main character, Casey, tries valiantly to get his dad, Dr. Brewer, to join in with a, a lovely father-son game of frisbee but dad's like not today i'm busy and like stomps inside and slams the door like you know a good parent would and casey's like what's his problem and his sister margaret is like oh you know what his problem is because sisters are always wiser she's like i'll play frisbee with you for a little while and casey's like whatever fine and then it turns out that Margaret is the perspective character, so we get her interiority, unless it does a thing that he did last time, where he just switches right at the end for funsies. For the twist. Hi, baby. So, they toss the frisbee back and forth. They're both really bad at frisbee. Margaret thinks long and hard about how California uh, doesn't really have seasons, because that's where they live, so it's relevant. She made a diving catch for a wild toss, rolling over on the manicured lawn and raising the frisbee above her head triumphantly. Show off, Casey muttered, unimpressed. You're the hot dog in the family, Margaret called. Well, you're a dork. This is a very witty repartee. And she's like, Casey, you're 11. Don't act like a two-year-old. And then he's like, well, you act like a one-year-old. And they went after the Frisbee. And Margaret's like, this is all dad's fault. And I mean, a lot of things could come back to that in any circumstance. But let's hear her out. Things have been so tense ever since he started working at home down in the basement with his plants and weird machines. He hardly ever came up for air, and when he did, he wouldn't even catch a frisbee. Uh, according to Margaret, Mom has noticed it too. Uh, it's made her really tense. She pretends everything's fine, but Margaret can tell that Mom is worried about Dad. So they're playing for a little bit longer, and then Casey out of nowhere is like, how come Dad got fired? She and Casey had never discussed this in the four weeks since Dad had been home which was unusual since they were pretty close, being only a year apart. So I guess Margaret is 12. That's some math I can do. I mean, we came all the way out here so we could work at Polytech, right? Casey asked. Yeah, well, he got fired, Margaret said, half whispering in case their dad might be able to hear. But why? Did he blow up the lab or something? Casey grinned. Margaret's like, botanists work with plants. They don't really uh, blow stuff up often. Ultimately, Margaret's like, I'm not sure what happened, but I overheard dad on the phone. I think he was talking to Mr. Martinez, his department head, remember? From what I overheard, it had something to do with the plants dad was growing, some experiments that had gone wrong or something. <sighs> Science stuff. Bam, bam, bam. Margaret's like, that's all I know. Come on, Casey, let's go inside. I'm dying of thirst. I am too, but like, at what cost, you know? So they're walking past the basement door where dad works, and it's slightly ajar, even though it's normally closed when dad's down there. And then Casey's like, let's go down and see what dad's doing. I'm gonna make Casey Southern for the sake of differentiation, because it's the one I can do most consistently. So let's go down and see what dad's doing. And Margaret doesn't take a lot of convincing. She just goes, okay, because she's, you know, a good sister and game for an adventure. She knew they probably shouldn't disturb their father, but her curiosity got the better of her. He'd been working down there for four weeks now. All kinds of interesting equipment, lights, and plants had been delivered. Most days he spent at least eight or nine hours down there doing whatever it was that he was doing and he hadn't shown it to them once <gasps> mysterious margaret's like yeah it's our house too let's do it besides maybe their dad was just waiting for them to show some interest margaret thought optimistically they're halfway down when their father appeared at the foot of the stairs he glared up at them angrily his skin strangely green under the fluorescent light fixture he was holding his right hand drops of red blood falling onto his white lab coat stay out of the basement he bellowed that was fast in a voice they'd never heard before 
I don't know if that's stupid or scary, but it's a title drop and I'm drinking. Both kids shrink back, surprised to hear their father scream like that. He was usually so mild and soft-spoken. Stay out of the basement, he repeated, holding his bleeding hand. Don't ever come down here. I'm warning you. It's good knowing, I mean, like, I appreciate that we're starting right in the middle of the drama and everything, the, uh, Mr. Hiding of the Dr. Jekyll and all of that, but, um, I feel like this would be better if we were, like, first introduced to Dad being a good dad. It would be more effective to see him be, like, shitty and monstrous if we were initially introduced to him and he was like a good nice dad i think that would be more effective but it's not my story and i'm never gonna argue with rl trying to cut to the chase a little bit faster uh oh but anyway dun 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 that was the end of the chapter so we drink this horrifying gross beverage 15 mm, percent. so chapter two mrs brewer their mom is like come say goodbye to your mother because she's going on a trip Margaret's friend Diane Manning, who lived just around the corner, isn't that isn't that always the way? They, their fr best friend is always like next door neighbors with them. It's convenient, I'll say that much. She's there. She follows them into the hallway and is like, "How long are you going to be gone, Mrs. Brewer?" Because that's obviously what she sounds like. And Mrs. Brewer's like, "I don't know. My sister went into the hospital in Tucson this morning. I guess I'll have to stay until she's able to go home." What is it? What happened? What is so bad? Okay. It's so bad that she's going to visit, but not so bad that she doesn't seem terribly worried about it. So I'm just wondering what it is. Diane's very silly and goofs around and is like, well, I'll be glad to babysit for Casey and Margaret while you're away. And Margaret's like, give me a break. I'm older than you are, Diane. Mrs. Brewer's like, I'm not worried about you kids. I'm worried about your father. It's not mutually exclusive, mom. So da da da, they talk about how dad needs someone to make sure that he eats and whatever, even though he's their parent and they're his young children, not even teenage children. Margaret's like, it's going to be really lonely around here without mom. Dad hardly ever comes up from the basement. You have a brother. It had been two weeks since dad had yelled at Casey and her to stay out of the basement. Drink for the title drop. They had been tiptoeing around ever since, afraid to get him angry again. For the past two weeks, he had barely spoken to them except for the occasional good morning and good night. Don't worry about anything, Mom, she said, forcing a smile. Just take good care of Aunt Eleanor. I'll call as soon as I get to Tucson, Mrs. Brewer said. Oh, buddy. She took three long strides to the basement door, then shouted down, Michael, time to take me to the airport. Then Mrs. Brewer turned back to the kids. Think he'll even notice I'm gone? She asked in a loud whisper. She meant it to be a light remark, but her eyes revealed some sadness. This is serious. What if this entire book, there's like no monster thing happening at all? There's nothing supernatural here. Dad's just become distant and mean and no one knows why. It's just a serious family drama with no supernatural elements. So the two of them head out the front door. Diane says goodbye to them. Casey says goodbye to them. Margaret says goodbye to them. And Diane immediately is like, oh, let's go look at the experiments. Diane is rad. Apparently Diane loves math and science. She's a STEM girl through and through and she wants to see the experiments. Not some bratty kid way, but because she's like genuinely interested. So Margaret's like, there's all these like machines and plants down there, but he doesn't want us to go and look. And Diane's like, then we definitely have to go take a look. And Margaret's really hesitant. So Diane convinces her in the one way that always works in Goosebumps, no matter what, no matter how serious the thing is. She dares her and says, oh, you chicken. Margaret's like, I'm not afraid. And Diane keeps calling her chicken and starts walking toward the basement door. And then Casey's like, oh, are we going downstairs? Me too, wait for me. And so they all go and take a look. Just, and Margaret's like, okay, let's go. But remember, just looking, no touching. No touching! No touching! No touching! Casey pulled open the door and led the way onto the stairway. Stepping onto the landing, they were immediately engulfed in hot, steamy air. They could hear the buzz and hum of electronic machinery. And off to the right, they could see the glare of the bright white lights from Dr. Brewer's workroom. This is kind of fun, Margaret thought as the three of them made their way down the linoleum-covered stairway. It's an adventure. There's no harm in taking a peek. So why was her heart pounding? Why did she have this sudden tingle of fear? Dun, dun, dun. Chapter three. It's unbearably suffocatingly hot. We studied the rainforest in school, Casey said. Maybe dad's bills in a rainforest. Maybe, Margaret said uncertainly. She held back, gazing in both directions. The basement was divided into two large rectangular rooms. To the left, an unfinished rec room stood in the darkness. She could barely make out the outlines of the ping pong table in the center of the room. The workroom to the right was brightly lit, so bright they had to blink and wait for their eyes to adjust. 
Beams of white light poured down from the large halogen lamps on tracks in the ceiling. Wow, look! Casey cried, his eyes wide as he stepped excitedly toward the light. Reaching up toward the lights were tall, shiny plants, dozens of them, thick-stalked and broad-leafed, planted close together in an enormous, low trough of dark soil. It's like a jungle, Margaret exclaimed. The plants look like jungle plants, apparently. Leafy vines, tall, tree-like plants with long, slender tendrils, fragile-looking ferns, plants with gnarled, cream-colored roots poking up like bony knees from the soil. R.L.'s really flex in his descriptive skills in this one paragraph. She catches sight of some enormous red tomatoes on a slender yellow stalk. And Diane's like, oh, feel this one. And she's like rubbing her hand on this giant flat leaf. And Margaret's like, no touch! And Diane's like, yes, but just rub your hand on it, though. Margaret's like, well, it can't argue with that. And so she does. And then observes that it doesn't feel like a leaf. It's so smooth, like glass. <gasps> The three of them stood under the bright white lights, examining the plants for several minutes, touching the thick stalks, running their hands over the smooth, warm leaves, surprised by the enormous size of the fruits some of the plants had produced. Casey's like, it's too hot down here, and he pulls his t-shirt off over his head, and Diane makes fun of him for showing his body. And then he, like, his eyes widen in surprise, and Margaret's like, Casey, what's the matter? He points to a tall, tree-like plant. It's breathing! Diane laughed, but Margaret heard it too. Yeah, she could hear breathing sounds, and they seemed to be coming from the tall, leafy tree. Casey's right, Margaret said softly. You can hear it breathing. Maybe it has a cold. Maybe its vine is stuffed up. She moved closer. All three of them listened. Silence. She moved closer. All three of them listened. Silence. It stopped, Margaret said. Stop it, you two, Diane scolded. You're not going to scare me. Hi, look at this! Casey had already moved on. He stood in front of a tall glass case that stood on the other side of the plants. It looked a little like a phone booth with a shelf inside about shoulder high and dozens of wires attached to the back and sides. Margaret's eyes followed the wires to a similar glass booth a few feet away. Some kind of electrical generator stood between the two booths and appeared to be connected to both of them. It's never good. What could that be? Diane asked. Casey reached out to the glass door in the front of the booth. I just want to see if it opens, he said. He grabbed the glass and his eyes went wide with shock. His entire body began to shake and vibrate. His head jerked wildly from side to side. His eyes rolled up in his head. Oh, help! He managed to cry, his body vibrating and shaking harder and faster. Help me, I can't stop! Dun, dun, dun! I hope he's been gruesomely electrocuted, but I know that he's just faking it because it's goosebumps. Help me! Casey's whole body shook as if an electrical current were charging through him. His head jerked on his shoulders and his eyes looked wild and dazed. It took both girls a while to realize that Casey had stopped shaking and was laughing. Called it. That's very dumb and I'm gonna drink. Gotcha, he declared. How many times do I have to see an obnoxious character say gotcha in one of these books? That wasn't funny, Margaret screamed. You were faking it? I don't believe it, Diane cried, her face as pale as the white lights above them, her lower lip trembling. Diane's having a hard time believing a lot of stuff today, and sometimes she's right. So they leapt on him, and he kept saying gotcha, gotcha over and over and over again, and Margaret tickles him, and Diane calls him a rat, and then all of it's brought to a sudden halt by a low moan from across the room. All three kids raised their heads and stared in the direction of the sound. The large basement was silent now except for their heavy breathing. What was that? Diane whispered. They listened. Another low moan, a mournful sound, muffled like air through a saxophone. The tendrils of a tree-like plant suddenly drooped like snakes lowering themselves to the ground. Another low, sad moan. It's the plants, Casey said, his expression frightened now. Plants don't cry and moan, Diane said. These do, Margaret said. So the plants keep shifting around uh, in like very large ways and making noises like people, you know, just non-creepy stuff in general. Casey's eventually like, okay, we got to get out of here like right now. And Diane is like, yeah, it's creepy down here. Let's go. Margaret's like, yeah, dad will probably explain it. Will he, Margaret? Or will you say, hey, we were in the basement and then he shouts at you, stay out of the basement. And then you never find anything else out. A tall tree-like plant sighed and appeared to bend toward them, raising its tendrils as if beckoning to them calling them back. Let's just get out of here, Margaret exclaimed. All three of them were out of breath by the time they ran up the stairs. Casey closed the door tightly, making sure it clicked shut. That was all very creepy, and I'm gonna drink. Dad warned us not to go down there, Margaret said, struggling to catch her breath. I guess he knew it would look scary to us, and we wouldn't understand. Yeah, I wonder why. Diane's just like, okay, that was creepy, I'm out of here, and bounces. 
So then she disappears, and their father's dark blue station wagon turned the corner and started up the driveway. Back from the airport, Margaret said, that was fast. Do they live next to the airport? She turned from the door back to Casey a few yards behind her in the hallway. Is the basement door closed? Yeah, Casey replied, looking again to make sure. No way, Dad will no way. He stopped. His mouth dropped open, but no sound came out. His face went pale. My t-shirt, Casey exclaimed, slapping his bare chest. I left it in the basement. Oh no, Casey. Dun, dun, dun. Chapter five, Casey says, I've got to get it. Otherwise dad will know. And Margaret's like, it is too late. He is up the drive. Casey's like, it'll only take a second. I'll run down and run right back up. No, Margaret stood tensely in the center of the narrow hallway. He's parked. He's getting out of the car. But he'll know, Casey cried. He's not going to kill us, Casey, just because we took a peek at his plants. Margaret stopped. She moved closer to the screen door. Hey, wait, what's going on? Casey asked. Hurry, Margaret turned and gestured with both hands. Go, get downstairs fast. Mr. Henry from next door, he stopped dead. They're talking about something in the driveway. So Casey flings open the basement door and disappears. Margaret heard him clumping rapidly down the stairs, then heard his footsteps fade as he hurried into their father's workroom. So she's keeping watch. She's watching Mr. Henry chat it up with dad, but she also knows that dad never talks for long with the neighbors. Her father was nodding now, a tight smile on his face. Still shielding his eyes, Dr. Brewer gave Mr. Henry a quick wave. Then both men spun around and began walking quickly toward their houses. So Margaret's like willing Casey to come back faster because dad's on his way back. How long does it take to pick up your shirt from the floor, etc, etc? It shouldn't take this long. Her dad was on the front walk now. He spotted her in the doorway and waved. Margaret returned the wave and looked back through the hallway to the basement door. Casey, where are you? She called aloud. No reply. No sound from the basement. No sound at all. Dr. Brewer had paused outside to inspect the rose bushes at the head of the front walk. Casey, Margaret called. Still no reply. Casey, hurry. Silence. Her father was crouching down, doing something to the soil beneath the rose bushes. Something. With a feeling of dread weighing down her entire body, Margaret realized she had no choice. She had to go downstairs and see what was keeping Casey. Dun dun dun. And so now we are doing a fun thing that doesn't often happen in Goosebumps books. We are switching to Casey's perspective. So, chapter six. Casey ran down the steps. See, it's like a time split. Like we saw what happened from Margaret's point of view. And now we're going to find out what Casey got up to. This is so exciting. I wonder if he dies. Casey ran down the steps, leaning on the metal banister so that he could jump down two steps at a time. He landed hard on the cement basement floor and darted into the bright white light of the plant room. He took a deep breath, inhaling the steamy air and held it. It was so hot down there, so sticky. His back began to itch. The back of his neck tingled. He saw his t-shirt lying crumpled on the floor a few feet from a tall leafy tree. The tree seemed to lean toward the t-shirt, its long tendrils hanging down loosely coiled on the soil around its trunk. Casey took a timid step into the room. Why am I so afraid? He wondered. Why do I have the feeling that there they're watching me because they're watching you, bro. This is creepy, though. I will drink this terrible, gross shit. He takes a few more steps toward the crumpled t-shirt and then stops because he can hear the breathing again. He took a step forward, then another. He could hear the breathing grow louder. Eee, scary. He hears Margaret's voice shout, Casey, where are you? And then calls back, okay, so far, but we know that she didn't hear that, so ah. He took another step and then another. The shirt was about three yards away. A quick dash and he'd have it. He hears Margaret call to hurry, and he's like, I am trying. The shirt's almost within reach, and he heard a groaning sound, then more breathing. He raised his eyes to the tall tree. The long, ropey tendrils had tensed, stiffened, already imagined it. No, they had been dropping loosely, but now they were taut, ready. For what? Ah! Casey, are you okay? Answer me, he hears Margaret shout. He grabbed the shirt. Two snake-like tendrils swung out at him. Huh? He cried out, paralyzed with fear. What's happening? The tendrils wrapped themselves around his waist. Let go, he cried, holding the t-shirt tightly in one hand, grabbing at the tendrils with the other. He tries calling for Margaret, but no sound comes out of his mouth. Eee. So he's struggling and struggling, and then finally is able to shout, let go, and then suddenly Margaret was standing beside him. He hadn't heard her come down the stairs and hadn't even seen her enter the room. Casey, she cried, what's... Her mouth dropped open and her eyes grew wide. It won't let go, he told her. No, she screamed, and grabbed one of the tendrils with both hands and tugged with all her strength. The tendril resisted for only a moment, then went slack. Casey uttered a joyful cry and spun away from the remaining tendril. Margaret dropped the tendril and grabbed Casey's hand and began running toward the stairs. Oh! They both stopped short at the bottom of the stairway. Standing at the top was their father, glaring down at them, his hands balled into tight fists at his sides, his face rigid with anger. Dun, dun, dun! Out of the frying pan, am I right? Chapter 7. Margaret's just like, Dad, the plants? <laughs> Which is fair. He stared down at them, his eyes cold and angry, unblinking. He was silent. One grabbed Casey, Margaret told him. 
I just came down to get my shirt, Casey said, his voice trembling. They stared up at him expectantly, waiting for him to move, to unball his fists, to relax his hard expression, to speak, but he glared down at them for the longest time. Finally, he said, You're okay? Yeah, they said in unison, both of them nodding. Margaret realized she was still holding Casey's hand. She let go of it and reached for the banister. I'm very disappointed in you both, Dr. Brewer said in a low, flat voice, cool but not angry. I don't know if I achieved that with my voice acting, but I think if you believe hard enough, then yes, I did. Margaret's like, I'm sorry, we knew we shouldn't. And then Casey lies out his ass and is like, we didn't touch anything really, which is obviously bullshit because the tree grabbed Casey. So even if they didn't touch, which they did, touch, no, touch, no. they still touched, you know? I'm, not, I'm just splitting hair is here, I guess, at this point. So Dr. Brew motions for them to come upstairs and then steps into the hallway. I thought he was gonna yell at us, Casey whispered to Margaret as he followed her up the steps. That's not Dad's style, Margaret whispered back. He sure yelled at us last time we started into the basement, Casey replied. They followed their father into the kitchen. He motioned for them to sit down at the white formica table, then dropped into a chair across from them. His eyes went from one to the other, as if studying them, as if seeing them for the first time. His expression was totally flat, almost robot-like, revealing no emotion at all. That's very scary. I think this one is doing a really, like a, oh, his tongue is blue, oh Jesus. I think this one's doing a really solid job of sort of the like fear of, the totally understandable fear that a child might have of like their parents no longer being reliable. And in fact, in this case, possibly being actively harmful. I think that's playing on that really well. But again, I do wish we had gotten at least a scene or two of, um, the dad before he started acting like this because right now we only have the narration's word to go on that he was once a good dad as far as i know from the textual evidence he's always been just the shittiest dad in the world so it would have been nice to like have that kind of comparison but as it stands it's doing a really good job playing on that very real fear anyway casey breaks the silence he's like dad what's with those plants and Dr. Rue was like, what do you mean? Like, come on. They're so weird, Casey said, understating it to an extreme. I'll explain to you someday, Dr. Brewer. I don't know what his voice sounds like. So it's just going to sound like however it sounds. And that's just, you're going to just have to deal. I'll explain them to you someday. It looks very interesting, Margaret said, struggling to say the right thing. Was their dad trying to make them feel uncomfortable, she wondered? If so, he was doing a good job of it. This wasn't like him. Not at all. He was always a very direct person, Margaret thought. If he was angry, he said he was angry. If he was upset, he'd tell them he was upset. So why was he acting so strange, so silent, so cold? I asked you not to go in the basement, he said quietly, crossing his legs and leaning back so that the kitchen chair tilted back. I thought I made it clear. Margaret and Casey glanced at each other. Finally, Margaret said, we won't do it again. But can't you take us down there and tell us what you're doing? Casey asked. He still hadn't put the t-shirt on. I, I don't need to know that. I like that we're having this serious conversation. RL's like, but just to be clear, this kid's still naked. Yeah, we'd really like to understand it, Margaret added enthusiastically. Someday, their father said. He returned the chair to all four legs and then stood up. We'll do it soon, okay? He raised his arms above his head and stretched. I've got to get back to work. He disappeared into the front hallway. Casey raised his eyes to Margaret and shrugged. Their father reappeared, carrying the lab coat he had tossed over the front banister. Uh, Margaret tries to make small talk about, like, I don't know, did mom get on the plane okay? And gee, I hope Aunt Eleanor is all right. And dad's not having any of it. He just is like, later, and disappears into the hallway and then goes down to, to the basement and shuts the door behind him. Casey uh, is very observant, and we know this because he says, he sure is acting weird. Nailed it, Casey. Margaret, very optimistically, is like, maybe he's upset because mom is gone. Okay, Margaret. Casey's like, I can't believe that plant grabbed me. No one's the concerned enough about that. Anyway, I think it's very dumb that no one's more concerned about this, so I'm gonna drink. I'm gonna have bad dreams tonight, he said glumly. Just don't think about the basement, Margaret advised. Easier said than done, Peggy. So she grabs, she goes up to her room and grabs her textbook and to like prepare to study or do homework or whatever it is people do with textbooks. But the words on the page blurred as the moaning breathing plants kept creeping back into her thoughts. At least we're not being punished for going down there, she thought. And at least dad has promised to take us downstairs with him soon and explain to us what he's working on down there. 
That thought made Margaret feel a lot better. It should not Margaret. Margaret is too young to recognize what a brush off sounds like, so. She felt better until the next morning when she woke early and went downstairs to make some breakfast. To her surprise, her father was already at work. The basement door was shut tight and a lock had been installed on the door. I mean, honestly, if that's where his lab is with science experiments and he has two young but not terribly young children in his house, he should have had a lock on the door regardless. Like, I don't know much about science, but a lot of it probably shouldn't be touched by 10 year olds at random. The next Saturday afternoon, that means nothing to me. I don't know what day of the week this was, but whatever. Margaret was up in her room, lying on top of the bed, talking to her mom on the phone. I'm really sorry about Aunt Eleanor, she said. Is she dead? The surgery didn't go as well as expected, her mother said, sounding very tired. The doctor said she may have to have more surgery, but she has to build up her strength first. You know, more surgery for the surgery for the thing that needed the surgery. I like how vague he's being. Like, he just couldn't decide what could possibly be wrong with Aunt Eleanor. So I'm just going to assume she's getting breast implants. They accidentally put three in, so she needs to have a little nap so they can take out the extra one. I guess this means you won't be coming home real soon, Margaret said sadly. Mrs. Brewer laughed. Don't tell me you actually miss me. Mom, you are aware of what dad is like right now. I would be less cavalier about your child being like, you are gone and I miss you a lot. Speaking of, Mrs. Brewer is like, how's your father doing? I spoke to him last night, but he only grunted, Mrs. Brewer said, dramatically oversharing about her sex life. In the background, Margaret could hear some kind of loudspeaker announcement. Her mother was calling from a payphone at the hospital. He never comes out of the basement, Margaret complained. Your father's experiments are very important to him, her mother said. More important than we are, Margaret cried. She hated that whiny tone in her voice. I feel you, girl. Though it's fair, you're what, you're 12? Like, yeah, it's fine. You're allowed to whine until- You've got a good couple years of whining left in you before people really start to blame you for it. Her mother had enough to worry about at the hospital. Margaret knew she shouldn't make her feel even worse. Margaret is the most considerate 12-year-old on the entire planet. This is ridiculous. She should not have to be this considerate. She's 12. She's a child. She should get to be a little shit. This is her time for that. It's really going to turn out that there's nothing going on. Her dad's just awful. And then she's, it's going to end with Margaret uh, in therapy, writing back upon this years later, catcher in the rye style. Your dad has a lot to prove, Mrs. Brewer said, to himself and to others. I think he's working so hard because he wants to prove to Mr. Martinez and the others at the university that they were wrong to fire him. He wants to show them that they made a big mistake. Yeah, that's not ominous. I'll show them, I'll show them all is never a good motivation for a science experiment, just historically, from like movies and stuff. Margaret's like, we used to see him more before he was home all the time. It doesn't make any sense to me. And her mother sighs impatiently, just like those trees did. And it's like, Margaret, I'm trying to explain to you. You're old enough to understand. And Margaret's like, listen, he's wearing a baseball hat like all the time now. Mom's like, Casey? Margaret's like, no, Mom, Dad. He's wearing a Dodgers hat. He never takes it off. That's a sign. That's a sign that something's wrong in anybody in any situation. Full offense to the Dodgers. Mrs. Brewer's like, really? And Margaret's like, we told him he looks really dorky in it, but he refuses to take it off. I think RL has made his stance on the Dodgers very, very clear. Mrs. Brewer laughs at how stupid her husband must look in that Dodgers cap, the dumbest of all apparel choices, and then says, uh-oh, I'm being called. Gotta run. Take care, dear. I'll try to call back later. And then she clicks and is gone. And Margaret's like, poor mom. She's so worried about her sister because of her third breast implant, and I had to go and complain about dad. Margaret doesn't, should not have to be this considerate. This is... not great. She's gonna have a lot to unpack in therapy in the years to come. So everything's quiet. Casey's over at a friend's. Dad obviously in the basement, door locked behind him. Margaret's like, maybe I'll call Diane. And then she realized she was hungry and she was like, lunch first, then Diane. She brushed her dark hair quickly for lunch, I guess, shaking her head at the mirror over her dressing table because she's going to go eat lunch by herself and needs to look good for it. To her surprise, dad was in the kitchen. He was huddled over the sink, his back to her. She started to call out to him, but stopped. What was he doing? Curious, she pressed against the wall, gazing at him through the doorway to the kitchen. Dr. Brewer appeared to be eating something. With one hand, he was holding a bag on the counter beside the sink. As Margaret watched in surprise, he dipped his hand into the bag, 
pulled out a big handful of something and shoved it into his mouth. Margaret watched him chew hungrily, noisily, then pull out another handful from the bag and eat it greedily. What on earth is he eating? she wondered. He never eats with Casey and me. He always says he isn't hungry. But he sure is hungry now. He acts as if he's starving. She watches him eat for a good long while, and then he crinkles up the bag and throws it into the trash can. Margaret quickly backed away from the door, tiptoed through the hall, and ducked into the living room. She held her breath as her father came into the hall, clearing his throat loudly. The basement door closed behind him. She heard him carefully lock it. When she was sure that he had gone downstairs, Margaret walked eagerly into the kitchen. She had to know what her father had been eating so greedily, so hungrily. So she pulls out the crinkled up bag from the trash and then gasped aloud as her eyes ran over the label. Her father had been devouring plant food. Dun, dun, dun. Obviously, Margaret freaks out. And then she's like, well, it's part of his experiment, clearly. I don't know if that's a conclusion I would draw, Margaret, but I guess there's not a lot of logical ones to draw, so the fact that you even arrived at any is pretty solid in my book. Go, Margaret. So she throws the bag out and then starts to turn away from the counter, and then she feels a hand on her shoulder and gasps, but it turns out to be Casey, who's home and wants to know what's for lunch. Dun, dun. So she makes him a peanut butter sandwich and then tells him what she saw. She tells Casey and Casey laughs and she's like, it's super not funny, bro. Read the room. Our own dad was eating dirt. Margaret punches him so hard that he drops his sandwich, which is valid, and then apologizes because she's too nice and is like, I just don't see why you're laughing at. This is sick. There's something wrong with dad, like something really wrong. And Casey is still not taking her seriously and is like, maybe he just had a craving for plant food. So Margaret's like, dad's changed a lot. Even since mom has been gone, he spends so much more time in the basement Casey's like, that's because mom isn't around. And Margaret's like, he's quiet and he's cold and he doesn't ever say a word to us. He used to kid around all the time and ask about our homework. So she's listing all the things he used to do and we're just going to have to take her word for it. And Casey's like, what are you trying to say? Dad's out of his tree? He's gone totally bananas? And Margaret's like, I don't know. Watching him gulp down that disgusting plant food, I just had this horrible thought that he's turning into a plant. I don't know why she would think that. Casey is being very cavalier about this for someone who is nearly strangled to death by living vines that her fa- that his father had grown. And the scene ends with him with him to asking her to make him another sandwich because he sucks. And I'm gonna drink. Monday afternoon after school, Margaret, Casey, and Diane are tossing a frisbee back and forth. In, sorry, tossing the frisbee back and forth in Diane's backyard. Diane tossed the disc high. It sailed over Casey's head into a row of fragrant lemon trees. So they're playing a harmless game of frisbee and then Diane decides to make it um, a bit of an attack and is like, so what's it like having a mad scientist for a dad? And Margaret gets very upset about this because this is a real serious thing happening to her family, Diane, and you don't need to make fun of her about it. And Diane's like, no, legitimately, I've been having nightmares about that shit from the basement. And Margaret's like, yeah, I've been having nightmares too. So glad we, all these three children have been scared by the world's worst father. So Diane says, my dad was talking about your dad the other night. She reveals the following information. She says, my dad said that your dad got fired from Polytech because his experiments got out of control and he wouldn't stop them. What do you mean? Margaret asked. The university told him he had to stop whatever it was he was doing, and he refused. He said he couldn't stop. At least that's what my dad heard from a guy who came into the sales room. This is the most accurate English accent I've ever done. Margaret hadn't heard this story. It made her feel bad, but she thought it was probably true. Something really bad happened in your dad's lab, Diane continued. Someone got really hurt or killed or something. That's not true, Margaret insisted. We would have heard if that happened. Yeah, probably, Diane admitted. My dad said your dad was fired because he refused to stop his experiments. That doesn't make him a mad scientist, Margaret said defensively. Yeah, all the other stuff does, though. I'm just telling you what I heard, Diane said. You don't have to bite my head off. So they play for a bit, they talk some more about school, and then Margaret's like, it's time to go. And she and Casey begin to jog home, cutting through familiar backyards. And Casey's like, we need a lemon tree. They're cool. And Margaret's like, oh yeah, that's just what we need in our house. Another plant. As they stepped through the hedges into their backyard, they were both surprised to see their dad. He was standing at the rose trellis, examining clusters of pink roses. Hey, dad, Casey called. Catch! He tossed the frisbee to his father. This is a dumb idea no matter what, but I read ahead a little bit on accident. Okay. 
Dr. Brewery turned around a little too slowly. The frisbee glanced off his head, knocking the Dodger's cap off. His mouth opened wide in surprise. He raised his hands to cover his head, but it was too late. Margaret and Casey both shrieked in surprise as they saw his head. At first, Margaret thought her father's hair had turned green, but then she clearly saw that it wasn't hair on his scalp. His hair was gone. It had all fallen out. In place of hair, Dr. Brewer had bright green leaves sprouting from his head. Dun, dun, dun! I will say that's underneath any Dodger's cap. Just try. Dr. Brewer, the world's worst father, has decided now is the time to comfort his children. He's like, it's okay. It's really okay. And they're like, Dad, your head is covered in leaves that are growing from your head. And Dr. Brewer's like, I know. That's why I put on the cap. I didn't want you two to worry. I guess you think your dad has gotten pretty weird, huh? He stared into Margaret's eyes. Feeling uncomfortable, she looked away. He's like, Margaret, you haven't said a word. What's wrong? What do you want to say to me? Margaret, the most emotionally mature and emotionally damaged 12-year-old on the planet, says, come on, tell us. Why do you have leaves growing out of your head? He's like, it's a side effect. Of what, dad? Of what? It's only temporary. It'll go away soon. My hair will grow back. But how did it happen? Casey asked. Staring at his father's Dodger's cap, it's the Dodger's cap that's to blame. Maybe you two would feel better if I explained what I'm trying to do down in the basement. Yeah, they've been asking for that for weeks, for months at this point. I've been so wrapped up in my experiments, I haven't had much time to talk to you. You haven't had any time, Margaret corrected him. I'm sorry, he said. I really am, but this work I'm doing is so exciting and so difficult. Did you discover a new kind of plant? Casey asked, crossing his legs beneath him. No, I'm trying to build a new kind of plant. Huh? Casey exclaimed. Have you ever talked about DNA in school? Their father asked. I'm so glad I committed to this really easy to do voice. It's so simple and... Uh, consistent and doesn't sound stupid at all. Good choice. Good job, me. Let me try to put it in some simple terms. Let's say we took a person who had a very high IQ. You know, real brain power. Let's say we were able to isolate the molecule or gene or tiny part of a gene that enabled the person to have such high intelligence. And then let's say we were able to transmit it into other brains. And then this brain power could be passed along from generation to generation. And lots of people would have high IQs. Do you understand? I recognize now that this is my mad scientist voice and it's also kind of an entrapta from She-Ra impression. Are you here to watch the social experiment too? It's the perfect place to observe behavior. Yeah, that tracks, I guess. He looked first at Casey, then at Margaret. Yeah, kind of, Margaret said. You take a good quality from one person and put it into other people. And then they have the good quality, too. And they pass it on to their children and so on. I think what we're describing here, everybody, is eugenics. But let's keep going. Very good, Dr. Brewer said, smiling for the first time in weeks. That's what a lot of botanists do with plants. They try to take the fruit-bearing building block from one plant and put it into another. Create a new plant that will bear five times as much fruit or five times as much grain or vegetables. And that's what you're doing, Casey asked. No! <laughs> well, the dad says, not exactly, but I feel like no is funnier. Come on, dad. There's always time for comedy. I'm doing something a little more unusual. I really don't want to go into detail now, but I'll tell you that what I'm trying to do is build a kind of plant that has never existed and could never exist. I'm trying to build a plant that's part animal. Ah, I'm going to drink. You can determine for yourself if it's because this is stupid or scary. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's both. You two understand why this must be kept a secret. Yeah, because it's unethical. And uh, Is that why, Dad? Is that the reason? How do you do it? Margaret asked. How do you get these cells from the animals to the plant? I'm trying to break them down electronically. I have two glass booths connected by a powerful electron generator. You may have seen them when you were snooping around down there. One booth is a sender and one is a receiver. I'm trying to send the right DNA, the right building blocks from one booth to the other. It's very delicate work. Have you done it? Margaret asked. I've come so close. His expression thoughtful, he abruptly climbed to his feet. Gotta get back to work. See you two later. He started walking across the lawn, taking long strides. But Dad, Margaret called after him. Your head, the leaves, you didn't explain it. 
Dr. Brewer shrugged. Don't worry about it. It's only temporary. Just a side effect. Then he hurried into the house. So Casey apparently is fine with Dad's explanation. He feels like it covered everything. But Margaret, being a sensible gal, was troubled by what her dad had said and even more troubled by what he hadn't said. Her father had not really explained the leaves growing on his head. Just a side effect didn't explain anything at all. So Margaret's in bed. She has a lot of questions that weren't answered and she's very upset and she's thinking about all of them. For instance, why was her dad gulping down all the plant food? She realizes that she and Casey hadn't really had any of the questions that they had wanted to ask answered. They were just so excited that their dad had finally sat down to talk to them that all of the questions they'd had sort of went out of their minds. It's devastating. His explanation was interesting, and it was good to know that he was close to doing something truly amazing. But what about the rest of it? A frightening thought entered her mind. Could he have been lying to them? No, she decided. Dad wouldn't lie to us. Girl, I feel like Dad's lying to you. So after the- she's thinking about this all night, and after her whole evening goes by, she's lying in bed, and she hears her father's soft footsteps coming up the carpeted stairs. She listened to her father's footsteps pass her room, heard him go into the bathroom, heard the water begin to run into the sink. And she decided she has to ask him. There's got to be a simple explanation. I mean, there is. It's just not one you're going to want to hear, girl. But she has to know. She padded softly down the hall, a sliver of light escaping through the bathroom door, which was slightly ajar. She stepped into the narrow triangle of light and peered into the bathroom. He was standing at the sink, leaning over it, his chest bare, his shirt tossed behind him on the floor. He had put the baseball cap on the closed toilet lid. Now the toilet's a Dodgers fan, too just like all Dodgers fans. He didn't notice her. He was concentrating on the bandage on his hand. Using a small scissors, he cut the bandage and then pulled it off. The hand was still bleeding, Margaret saw. Or was it? What was that dripping from the cut on her father's hand? Still holding her breath, she watched him wash it off carefully under the hot water. Then he examined it, his eyes narrowed in concentration. It couldn't be blood, could it? It was bright green. She gasped and started to run back to her room. The floor creaked under her footsteps. Who's there? Dr. Brewer cried. Margaret? Casey? He poked his head into the hallway as Margaret disappeared back into her room. He saw me, she realized, sleeping into bed. He saw me and now he's coming after me. I'm gonna dr- dun dun da. She pulls the covers up to her chin. She's shaking. She holds her breath. She can still hear water splashing in the bathroom sink and no footsteps. So he's not coming after her. If only mom were home, she thought. She reaches for the phone to tell, to call mom and just be like, hey, here's what's going on. But then she remembers it's 2.40 in the morning. Her mother's having such a terrible time in Tucson trying to care for her sister and her three boobies. Margaret couldn't frighten her like that. She heard the water in the sink shut off. She heard the bathroom light being clicked off. And then she heard her father pad slowly to his room at the end of the hall. Margaret relaxed a little, slid down in the bed, loosened her grip on the blankets. She closed her eyes and tried to clear her mind. She tried counting sheep. Does that ever work? Oh, (laughs) next sentence. That never worked. So she tries counting to a thousand. She doesn't make it past 375. Her head throbs. Her mouth is dry. So she decides to go downstairs and get a drink of cold water from the refrigerator. So she opens the refrigerator, was reaching for the water bottle when a hand grabbed her shoulder and she cries out and drops the open bottle onto the floor. Ice cold water puddled around her feet. What a waste. It's Casey and she's like, you scared me. What are you doing up? And he's like, what are you doing up? Casey's like, I just keep thinking about things. And Margaret's like, yeah, me too. She started to say something else, but a sound from the hallway stopped her. It was a plaintive cry, a moan filled with sadness. Margaret gasped and stopped dabbing. (laughs) Casey's eyes filled with fear. They heard it again, such a sad sound, like a plea, a mournful plea. It's coming from the basement, Margaret said. She crouched on her knees, not moving, just listening. Another moan, softer this time, but just as mournful. I don't think Dad told us the truth, she said to Casey, staring in his eyes. I don't think a tomato plant would make a sound like that. So Margaret puts her hand on Casey's shoulder and guides him out of the kitchen through the hall. And they stop at the basement door and listen. It's silent. Uh, Casey tried the door and it was locked. Another low moan, sounding very nearby now. It's so human, Casey whispered. Margaret shuddered. What was going on down in the basement? What was really going on? So mission thwarted. Margaret walks Casey back to his room and then walks back to her room. And then somehow she goes to sleep. Good for her, I guess. Brag. 
Her alarm went off at 7.30. She sat up and thought about school and then remembered that there was no school for the next two days because of some kind of teacher's conference. Convenient. So first thing she decides to do is go confront her dad, which is, you know, very brave of her. Good for you, Margaret. Stand up for yourself. She's like, dad's in the kitchen. It's still very early. He's not in the lab yet. And now's my chance to catch him and be like, hey, what the hell's going on? She considers waking up Casey, but then is like, he has been, he was up all night. Like one of us should sleep. And then she goes down the rest of the hall and stops at her parents' bedroom. And the door was open. The air was heavy and smelled strangely sour. The curtains were drawn. The bedclothes were rumpled and tossed at the foot of the bed. Does she mean the sheets? Is she talking like an old-timey person? She's talking about sheets? Margaret's like, ah, no, I missed him. He's probably already locked in the basement workroom. He must have gotten up very early. And what was that in the bed? (gasps) It's creepy. I'm going to have this at the ready anytime I'm spooked. Oh no, she cried, raising her hands to her face in horror. The bed sheet was covered with a thick layer of dirt. Ooh. Gross. The dirt was black and appeared to be moist. Ew, RL. And the dirt was moving. She leaned down to take a closer look at the layer of dirt. No, the dirt wasn't moving. The dirt was filled with dozens of moving insects and long brown earthworms, all crawling through the wet black clumps that lined her father's bed. Dun, dun, dun. Oh my God. Hey guys, so my phone storage is acting up really badly um, for no reason. So I'm just going to cut it right there since we were at about the halfway mark. Um, and I will try to get the next one out as soon as possible. Not like last time when there was like a month in between. I still feel very bad about that. Obviously there was a big break between this one and the last one too. Anyway, not to dawdle. I'll just do the quick plugs before my phone freaks out again. Check me out on Patreon. It's pretty cool and it'll be really helpful and you'll get a blooper reel. So I'm just going to really quick read this message from one of my great patrons. He, uh, paid money so I could read this personalized shout out right at the end. And I'm going to do it. And I don't know what any of it means. So, from a certain old man for discerning viewers, everything's going to be okay. Margot the Scottish Fold Munchkin is so cute. I believe that. That's a cute breed. Uh, Matthew is adorable, but Evelyn is excellent. I hope that's not coded for anything. Keep your loved ones safe, ominous, with Dark Imperador. Imperator? I don't know how to say that one. Uh, Spanish marble floors. It sounded weird, but I took Steve Ray's advice and my problems just vanished. Steve is the... Anyway. Jared has a scheming mind of all the words to live without. The best would be this thing I doubt. I'm not drunk, but Mike Wessel is drunk. Shelby is awesome. We have all the time in the world. And vote for animal topics. That's cool. I hope all those things mean things that are nice. I'm pretty drunk. Uh, That blue shit fucked me up.